Hey guys, welcome to part three of our series on building looks. We've come a long way in our first two videos, but today we're gonna to move past contrast curves and split toning and use color theory to add a harmonized palette for our images. Creating this color palette is a huge part of adding consistent polish to your look, and it's gonna save you tons of time when you get into grading your shots individually. Let's dive in. So let's do a quick review of where we've come thus far in the creation of our look that we've been working on over the course of this series. We started off with our simple technical mapping here, which is just taking me from my camera color space to my display color space. That's great, now I'm not completely devoid of color and contrast, but my image has no real character to it. There's certainly no look going on. So our first step uh, from this point was to create our global contrast curve, which you see here. And when I flip this note on, you can see its result. It's a nice global baseline of contrast that's gonna carry over across all of my image. We've got a uh, black point set, we've got a knee, we've got a shoulder, and we've got a white point set. Good beginning. Next thing up that we did was create some split toning and add that into the mix of the contrast curve. Split toning being a push of cooler colors into our shadow regions and warmer colors into our highlight regions. Helps to create some more color separation, some more colorfulness, and some overall depth for our image. So we're well on our way. Our image is really starting to come together, but we're now ready to really go in and refine and start looking at more minute details. Now, what we're gonna do today is not gonna have as dramatic of an impact on the image as these first two steps did, but it's a huge part of the process of really finessing your look and taking it from an okay or a good look to a great look that is really gonna elevate the entirety of your piece. So we're gonna do this with more curves. We're gonna do it upstream of what we've done thus far. And instead of using our custom curves, we're gonna use a couple of our Hue Versus tools. We're gonna to kind of go through these one by one and make some adjustments on each so you can see the way I like to think about these tools and implement them when creating an overall look. So the first thing I'm gonna do here in my Hue Versus Hue section is I'm gonna to start to evaluate what are the colors in my frame that I may want to sweeten or rotate in some way? And the first one up that I'm identifying is the kind of like yellowy green of this cabinet that I'm seeing here. I feel like I could get some better separation of it from the rest of the colors in the frame, get a more pure primary green by rotating things counterclockwise a little bit. So let's look at what that looks like. I'm just gonna take my eyedropper here and drag this region right there inside the cabinets. And I'm gonna take my control point and I'm just gonna start to drop it down, which is gonna rotate me counterclockwise. You can see that little trace that's moving on my vector scope right here, taking me from somewhere kind of in between green and yellow to a more pure green. And of course you can see it in the frame as well, that green is really popping now. And this is a good thing to remember, is that when you're making your hue rotations like this, Whenever you're making a rotation from a more secondary to a more primary hue, like I'm doing right now, secondary being like, oh, it's this hue sort of in between green and yellow, and I'm taking it toward more of a pure green. In addition to the hue shift that you get, you're also gonna get a change in saturation. Things are gonna feel more saturated because you're on a more pure primary hue after you've made that rotation. And you may find in some cases that you wanna counter for that when you get into your hue versus sat and say, hey, I wanna desaturate this hue a little bit. Things are starting to feel too saturated. And the opposite is also true. If you were to be rotating from a more pure hue vector, toward a more secondary one, that's often gonna be accompanied by a perceptual saturation loss. So in those situations, again, you may wanna counter in hue versus sat by boosting the saturation of that hue that you've landed on for that particular vector. In this case, I'm not so sure I hate that added saturation that I'm getting by uh, moving things toward that green vector. I think that looks kind of nice. So that's a good start with making that kind of yellow-green rotation. The next thing that I want to look at is uh, this man's sweatshirt here. I feel like this could go from, uh, you know, more, this kind of, you know, cyan blue that it's in, and I could get a cleaner vector out of it by moving, moving it toward more of a pure blue. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to eyedropper some pixels here on his sweatshirt, look at what it's given me here in the graph, and I'm gonna to start to pull that counterclockwise. And again, I've kinda of got one eye on the image, one eye on my scopes here, because I'm trying to push things toward more of my pure blue vector over there. And if I turn these on and off, we can now start to look at 
the net of our adjustments. I'm just starting to get some more separation and some more colorfulness by articulating these hue vectors a little bit more. And you can see it expressed not only visually in the frame, but on my vector scope, I've got these two much more kind of articulated uh, hue angles than I had before because of those hue rotations that I've made. So I feel like I'm on my way here. These are a couple of good hue versus hue adjustments, and I can continue to tinker and refine here, but I think I'm pretty happy with this for the moment. I'm gonna flip now over to my hue versus sat and start to play with what hues get what level of saturation and whether I want to tune any of those things. So the first thing that I'm seeing to my eye, I feel like maybe we're a little oversaturated in some of our hues, but uh, I'm also feeling like here on uh, the guy's sweatshirt, I feel like I could actually do with some more saturation. So I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna eyedropper uh, these pixels again, and I'm gonna take my control point, and I'm gonna give a nice healthy push uh, of additional saturation like so, and really try to get some extra color out of that hue vector like so and you can see that starting to react in my vector scope as well and that's always a good trick you can do as well if you're like i just want to see is this doing anything is this doing enough you can control click on a control point and watch it pop back to where it started here in your scope and then simply drag it back up uh, and, and uh, land it wherever you like it to go so i think that's a nice start on uh, saturating uh, the blue of his sweatshirt Next thing I want to do is start to tame in a couple of hues. And really the one that uh, is popping out to me most is his skin. I like what I'm getting out of my split toning layer over here. I like the depth that it's adding, but it combined with the overall contrast pump that's coming from my curve is leaving me with a skin tone that feels a little oversaturated. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit and I'm going to sample his skin with my eyedropper. And I'm gonna try desaturating that a little bit, like so. Just so that it's not quite so crazy. It's still a nice healthy skin hue, it's just not slamming quite as hard on the vector scope. So that's a good start there. And I actually think I might even wanna widen this out to include another hue in this general neighborhood, the pure reds of uh, some of the hardware and like these canisters and things that I'm seeing. Same kind of verdict there, like they look nice and they're really nicely separated right now. I just don't think we need to be going quite this far with that saturation to get that same effect. So I'm gonna once again sample some pixels out of this piece of hardware and I'm gonna grab the control point that it indicated for me, which is this one. And I'm gonna start to drop that control point down as well. And now as I begin to dial that in, I'm gonna on off my work again and start to look at where I'm netting out with everything. And it's worth noting obviously that as I do this, I'm looking at the net on off of all of the adjustments that we've made today here in our color palette. But I actually like this because you're gonna find that these tools have a tremendous amount of crosstalk and interaction. So it doesn't do me that much good to tune these things individually without looking at their net results. I really wanna see uh, everything combined together and begin where I started and then look at where I've landed and see whether I actually like uh, where that conclusion has drawn me. And looking at it that way, I feel like I pulled a little too much color out of uh, his skin. So I'm gonna bring that back a little bit and maybe go a little bit further with desaturating my reds like so. And I think I'm well on my way. I've got a good set of hue rotations. I've got some nice uh, hue saturation shifts that I'm doing here with my hue versus sat. And then one final thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my hue versus loom. And I'm gonna look at dropping the luma of a particular set of hues. And specifically what I'm looking at is again, this red hardware and these red canisters. They look better than they did before, but I feel like I can add some more depth and dimension and some more kind of filminess to this look by dropping the luma of these hues. I don't wanna drop the saturation, I just wanna drop the luminance. I wanna feel a little bit deeper with them. So once again, I'm gonna sample some pixels over here and I'm gonna see how I like it if I take my control point and just drop things down a little bit, get a little more filmy, a little deeper with it like so. And I think I'm really digging that. So once again, I wanna turn the net of this palette node off and back on. And I think you can see that I've really started to refine a nice color palette for my image. You can see it visually here in the image. I, I definitely prefer having this on. I like what it's doing globally to the color palette. 
but you can also look at the vector scope and see that I've got more unique separated vectors poking out of my sort of central mass of the vector, which is a good way of kind of getting a gut check on how your color separation is doing. The more you can see individual vectors popping out here, generally speaking, the better color separation you've got, which is a huge part of pleasing the human eye. It makes the image more legible. It creates color harmonies like we're getting here between our warm and our cools. It's just a really nice thing to uh, be mindful of and to seek out when you're creating looks. And as you can imagine, as you can see with what I did today, there's a million ways to do this. It's very subjective. It's very dependent on your vision for the particular project you're working on but this is a procedure a workflow a system that you can employ for whatever look you're building this is a great order to go in build your contrast curve set up some split toning if you like it and then finally really spend some time fussing over the overall color palette of your image where should reds live in terms of their hue and saturation and density, their luminance? Where should skin tone live? Where should green? Where should blue? All of the dominant colors in your frame, how are you articulating them and how are you sweetening them and, and uh, defining them and separating them from one another? This is a great place to spend your time and every minute that you spend doing this at the global level is gonna pay dividends because it means every shot when you land on it is gonna look better out of the box and you're gonna be able to move faster and get better results results in less time. And the last thing I want to do today is to keep myself organized, to keep my labeling system going so that I know what my look and its components are, and I can continue to go in and tweak and refine and explore and enable, disable these elements throughout my grading process. Because here's the reality, I can build however great a look I want to kind of in anticipation at the beginning of a project, and that's definitely the way that I typically work, and, and I would certainly encourage that for you. But you're gonna find once you get into grading individual shots, you're gonna be bouncing back over to your global look level all the time to make tweaks and refinements and adjustments as you're zeroing in on what you want your images to be and how you want your look to serve them. So the last thing I wanna to do today is simply give myself a label on this node that we've created today. And we're gonna call it palette. Again, this is just some good shorthand for me so that I can quickly bounce over to my timeline level and look at the components of my look and adjust and evaluate them throughout my grading process. It's time for me to let you in on a secret. We've just completed the third step in a process that has been around for as long as movies themselves, the creation of a print stock. Before we had digital intermediate, Film print stocks played the role of our look, creating our global contrast and split toning and colorimetry. What was and is great about traditional film print stocks is that they're the result of obsessive engineering and they do their job incredibly well. The downside is that there have only ever been a handful of print stocks to choose from at any given time, so if you couldn't find one that served your creative vision, you were simply out of luck. Today, with Digital Intermediate, we have the best of both worlds in that we can design a custom print stock for every project that we tackle. Now, if you're a busy content creator or independent filmmaker or post-professional, you may not always have time to build a look from scratch like we've been doing in this series. For these situations, I've developed Coloid, a set of DaVinci Resolve plugins which allows you to quickly build a custom filmic look without the hit or miss black box quality of a LUT. Everything is fully tunable and fully under your control. If you'd like to learn more about this or grab a free 24 hour trial, check out the link above, which I'm also gonna leave down below in the description. And if you've enjoyed this series thus far, be sure to check out part four, where we're gonna wrap things up by looking at one of my favorite specialized looks, the color wash. See you then.